Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, we talk about covered calls for your concentrated stock holdings, retitling your beneficiary designations into a trust, and how your 401k affects your Roth eligibility. Stick around. That's coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Craftwork Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed, and please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka, who in an attempt to fix the the white void of light that he's normally sitting in, I think has made it worse, but way more entertaining for me. <laughs> yeah. Now got a strong amount of camera shake as he moves and a banjo sitting behind him. <laughs> we have reduced the quality of video on our podcast to a great degree, uh, hopefully for some of your all's entertainment. But welcome to another show. At least for your entertainment. I hope no one hears the six minutes that preceded this uh, because it was chaos. I have reoriented my computer onto my lap with the goal of getting the sun glare out from behind me. Apparently, that was a mistake. I then unscrewed the microphone from its base because it was awkwardly sitting basically on my belly, and I'm holding it in my hand now, and I've committed to this at least for today. So here we are. Yeah. Well, we're we're here... This is my favorite episode of the month. Every single month that we do it, we are doing a mailbag episode. We are diving into our chaotic outlook inbox to see what our listeners want to hear us talk about, as well as their feedback from prior shows. We've got a lot of stuff going on in the inbox today. We've got people struggling to even hear the show, which I'm certain isn't our fault because it is working on the podcast platform they're listening on, but I don't know how to troubleshoot that beyond, hey, I'm sorry, it's not working, but like we uploaded it to Apple. Like they have it. We know that they have it. We can tell. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what we can do to help there, but there's other good stuff happening in there, which is feedback and questions and stuff that you and I can talk about as part of our show today. Do we get any fun junk mail in that inbox? Oh, goodness. It's unbelievable how much junk, because I think the fact that it's a publicly, because we like list that email address on all the podcast episodes, every web crawler in the world that's just looking for email addresses can find it. And so it is almost exclusively junk. There have been many different kings in Nigeria that have offered us tremendous amounts of money. Literally, I just opened it up the first one in there says that it's from somebody at fbi.com. Which, <laughs> by the way, uh, that's not the email address for the FBI. Oh, this is supposedly the Assistant Director, Finance and Facilities Division, FBI Special Agent. Like literally, we get stuff like this constantly because it thinks that we are not in good shape. That might be true. Oh, wow. The, uh, you know what is in the junk is another person that says our episodes won't download on Apple Podcasts. Maybe it's not just isolated. Huh. That's interesting because I download them on Apple and it seems to be working fine, but we should, maybe that is something we should troubleshoot. Yeah, I, I just don't know how to fix it because like I, I looked at the Apple website for podcasts for our show and it plays on all of them. So they obviously have it. Hmm. I wonder if maybe playing is different than downloading. We'll, we'll put our people on People it. are listening to our show to hear us troubleshoot our own podcast. We're going to work on it and we're going to try. Sure. Let's get into our first question. This comes to us from Jake. Topic of the question, do 401k contributions affect a Roth? It says, my income is on the income limit line that allows him to make contributions to a Roth IRA. However, if he takes contributions to his 401k, as well as his wife's contributions to the 403b, they would be below the threshold. Does that limit apply before or after the contributions are taken out? And are there other ways that we could lower our income? So Dan, let's start there. What is the income threshold for contributions to a Roth IRA? And does the pre-tax nature of a 403b or a 401k contribution affect this? 
Yes. So that's a great question. And the contributions, if you're making pre-tax contributions to a 401k or 403b, that would reduce your income for the purposes of making Roth IRA contributions. So you're thinking along the right lines, and that could drop you to a point where you can make your Roth contributions just as normal, which is fantastic. As far as income limits for making a Roth IRA contribution for 2024, the cap for a single filer is 161000 And for married filing jointly, that is 240000 in 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so hopefully that helps calibrate as to where your income is relative to those thresholds. I will mention those are the top end. So there is a phase out just below that. So it's worth just monitoring where you're going to be on an annual basis. I think this might be the single most common topic on our show. I, I think talking about like where these income limits are and how you can get money into a Roth versus like these other buckets is probably the one thing we talk about more than anything else. Would you agree with that? I would say so. Because it, it does seem like it is kind of the, the, the key thing people are trying to figure out is, can I use this and how do I use it? And like, what am I eligible for? Right. And the interesting question here is, right, they're talking about, it sounds like they're already maximizing or maximizing their 401k contributions to reduce income. If that's not true and you were trying to fall into the spot where you can make a Roth IRA contribution, many 401ks have Roth 401ks without income limitations at the moment. So I think for many, that's probably an easier bridge to cross than having to finagle all sorts of wizardry to reduce income to get Roth dollars in. But if you're already capping out your contributions and have extra money to save, I think this is a productive line of thinking. So keep in mind with any of these, when we're talking about IRA contributions, those don't have to be made during the calendar year that you're counting them for. So if you're in this situation and you're sitting there going, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a Roth this year, just wait. You, you can wait until you get to the end of the year because if you're that close to the line where you think you might be over the threshold or over the phase out, you could get a raise this year and that screws it up. You could get a bonus this year. You could change jobs this year. Like there's a lot of year left. We're, we're sitting here yeah. at the end of March. And, you know, if you're in like a government job and it's been steady for the last 20 years, and you know exactly what you're going to make. Like, okay, that's cool. And, and maybe you've got that level of confidence in what your year is going to look like. But if I were anywhere near that threshold personally, I would just wait. Now you could be doing a monthly contribution to that Roth. And that's frustrating because it generally, if you believe the market's going to go up, not having the money invested from now until let's call it this time next year, you could forego some savings or some, some interest and some gains on that money. But I would rather do that than risk having to do a removal of excess contribution. Like if you put too much money in and then it turns out you over earned, you, you can back it out. Right. That happens all the time. You wouldn't be the first person that's ever done that and gone, oops, I put money into a Roth IRA. Now I need to get that money back out of there. But doing it is kind of annoying. Some brokers will do the math for you. They should do the math for you. We have worked with brokers in the past that will not. They basically say, do the math and tell us how much you want us to take out, which that sucks. Yes. But basically, it's like the excess amount that you put in plus the growth on right. that money. So the proportion of your growth has to come back out. Rather than risk having to do that, I would just wait. The money that I'm intending to put into my Roth IRA, I would just park it into a high yield savings for the year. I'm going to make my 4 to 5%. And then as soon as I know what my formal income was for the calendar year, when I get prepared to file my taxes, you go ahead and make your contribution. You make it for the last calendar year. So until you file, you can do that. You can still, as you're sitting here right now, if you were eligible for a Roth in 2023 or any IRA contribution in 2023, you have until you file your taxes to do that. So it's not based on the calendar year. That is completely different from how the 401k works. The 401k works on the calendar year. You cannot fund your 401k for 2023 at this point. So... 
I know we hammer some of these things home probably too heavily, but I think because of how confusing they are, because of how often we're having to talk about it, because of all these like different rules, we're just going to keep saying it. So I, I hope that helps somebody. If you're getting ready to file your taxes and you could have done a contribution but didn't, or you want to do a contribution but didn't, or you're worried about this coming year, I think it's better just to wait and, and figure out exactly where your income comes in, get ready to prep your taxes, and then do it then. Another thing you can do to reduce your taxable income up until the filing deadline is HSA contributions. A lot of people think about that in the calendar year too, but you can actually make HSA contributions for the prior year up until you file your taxes as well, which is another way you can reduce your taxable income. And if you're HSA eligible, I would highly encourage that you look into those as well because there are very few vehicles as favorable from a tax standpoint as HSAs. I'm a big fan of HSA plans. Triple tax free, baby. Hard to get to. Next question for today. This comes to us from Krista, who I believe has also been a longtime listener. We appreciate you, Krista. She says, we have a trust for our house, but I've never felt that we needed to move all of our bank accounts to the trust. I named beneficiaries on each account, which is a lot easier and less expensive than updating our trust and adding every account. It also seems like it would be quicker for our beneficiaries to get the money when we pass if they are named beneficiaries. Am I missing a reason why it's better to put the accounts in a trust rather than just name beneficiaries? Okay, so standard disclaimer applies. Dan and I are not lawyers. This moves very quickly into legal advice, which we are not qualified to give you. I think we could both play one on TV. I'm going to make that Ooh. claim right now. You think we could play lawyers? I think so. I think we'd be great lawyers on TV. I think we like to argue. We do. Uh, that, that's, that, isn't that like the phrase they used to use for kids? They'd be like, yeah, you're going to make a lawyer someday. And, <laughs> and you, or you, you, like, you'd make a great lawyer one day. And the kid's like, yeah, that means I'm smart. And what that parent is really telling you is that you're kind of being an a-hole. Right. You're argumentative and difficult. Yeah, you're you're annoying and in a profession that most people find to be as a category, not as individuals, but as a category, not the most pleasant people to deal with. Right. So Ross and I, I know could Ross appear on like, TV, yeah. but we are not currently certified to provide legal advice. Correct. Uh, so on the fringes of what we're allowed to say about this. So let's talk about the process of what happens when somebody passes and there's a beneficiary on an account. So this is true, whether it's your IRA, whether it's a, a bank account that has a payable on death or, or you know, a brokerage that has a transfer on death. But essentially, when somebody passes, you reach out to the institution, you notify, most of them have an estate department or some sort of a you know, death notifications department that takes in that information. You let them know. And they say, okay, we're going to need a few things to prove that this is what's happened. Oftentimes, they will need a copy of a death certificate that proves this person is actually no longer with us. And then they're going to look at the beneficiary designation on the account. That beneficiary designation, assuming it is still in good order, may have a couple different names on it, maybe just a single name on it. And so, for example, if I passed and I said, Dan is going to get my assets... The bank is going to ask Dan for my death certificate. He's going to provide it. And then they're going to say, okay, Dan, we need to open a new account in your name. Once that is established, the bank's department will move the money from my account to yours. And that transaction will be considered closed. When a trust owns a bank account, there is no death, essentially, because there is no end to the trust. I like to tell people having a trust is sort of like having a company. You can change who's the CEO and who's making decisions. Think of that as the trustee, but the trust itself does not experience a death. It is just a, an institution or, or you know basically an entity on its own. And so you wouldn't have that process of having to move the money, right? It, it's not a matter of me having to let them know or, or Dan having to let them know and then open the new account in his name, what he basically provides in that instance would be the same notification that says, I am the successor trustee. I am now you know, in charge of this account and the account doesn't move. 
So it doesn't have to be retitled. It doesn't have to change hands upon death if it's already going to stay in that trust. That's really the difference. Yeah. And I think either are fairly simple. What it comes down to is what you want the desired outcome to be. So oftentimes when I think of trusts, you have a much higher level of specificity as what to what happens with the assets. So if you're going asset to single person or asset to people divvied up as you want under the beneficiary des- designation, I think that can accomplish someone's goals. But if you're looking for anything more than that, a trust is a much more elegant vehicle. Uh, and if you feel like you might want to make changes in the future, being able to change it at the trust level with an addendum might be also easier than going and locating all the places where you've set up instructions and adjusting them that way. So again, it, it depends what your goals are and what you how you think your goals may change over time. Uh, and I would let that dictate what I ultimately chose to do. So the one thing in the question that I found interesting was the note about expense to update all the bank accounts. There shouldn't be an expense associated with that. Right. Because in, in most cases, what you're going to have is a revocable trust document. Normally, financial institutions are going to ask you for the title page, which is like the first page of it, and then the signature pages. They normally don't need the whole thing. And what you're going to do is really just provide the existing trust to the financial institution so that they can create the, the account in the right name and with the right language on it. And it might say the revocable you know, the, the Maseka family trust or whatever, it's going to have the date that that trust was created. And then that's going to become the account title. But normally that doesn't require amending the trust. It's not like the trust has to list every account that is in it. It's the opposite. The accounts that you have retitled are going to have the name of the trust on it. And that's what you're actually changing. So there shouldn't be a lot of cost to update your accounts into the name of the trust. That's actually one of the most common mistakes I see people make is they'll set up the trust document and think that they've done their trust work, but you need to fund the trust by titling your assets in the name of the trust. Otherwise, you've done nothing but pay a lawyer, basically. So you do need to trust that doesn't have anything in it. Right. It's the same with uh, like company buy-sell agreements where you're setting up a continuation plan in the event one of your business partners passes where they'll draft the document, but they won't fund it. And part of the buy-sell is, where's the money going to come from to execute this? And that's in buying life insurance, which is step two. Step one is paying the lawyer. Step two is taking the action you said you were going to take to let that come into play. You know why I'm guessing she asked it that way? Mm -hmm. Is because retitling the house is... Expensive. Correct. It's, It's the filing fees and the documentation... Which is why when we talk about things like the blockchain and like what could a future use of it be, titling homes and like record keeping on a very public level could be a possible use for that. So you don't have to spend all those record keeping and filing fees when you retitle the house. So I don't think, again, talk to your lawyer, whoever created the trust, they will tell you what they think should be in it. But putting your bank accounts in the trust, if that's what they've recommended, shouldn't be a big cost item. It, it's a little bit of time, but there shouldn't be a hard cost to it like retitling a house actually would have. Right. It, and it shouldn't even be a ton of time either. I served this role, I think my first job out of college, I was the banker who had to look at the death certificates and all that. Like It is a process, but it's not a time-consuming process. If you're ready with all the documentation you need, it's fairly efficient. Okay. Let's get into the next one that we've got here. Subject to this email was covered calls, an item that is near and dear to my heart. This comes to us from Scott. He says he works for a long-standing publicly traded company. I'm going to eliminate some of the details he wrote in here, but we're just, we're, we're just going to assume that he's got quite a bit of the stock in his portfolio. Okay. He says, in general, I try to take a balanced approach to managing my exposure to the company's share price. My goal has been to maintain a reasonable percent in my portfolio, generally between 5 and 15%, to enjoy the dividend that this company pays with the intention of selling out when the stock rises to a certain price. Given that intent within the portfolio, I'm interested in using covered calls for my shares of company stock, something I learned a mentor and coworker does with his company stock holdings. 
I have zero options trading experience, so this would be new for me. Based on what I've read, it seems like selling covered calls with the company stock I own aligns with how I'm treating it in my portfolio today. Keep it for the dividend, sell out when the price gets high for a limited amount of the holding and would be a way to enjoy an even higher payout in the short term. What do we think about this? I think he's on the right track. I mean, what he's described himself as doing is in the spirit of what writing covered calls would be, except you're getting paid to do it in the meantime. 100%. Yeah. So so we start with a couple things on a covered call. Okay. So I know people's head starts to spin when options get brought up. I think they are confusing because you can trade a call in a bullish or bearish way. You can trade a put in a bullish or bearish way. I think the fact that there's multiple directions is what makes this so confusing. If all we said was that calls are bullish, puts are bearish, I think people would get it. But it's the fact that you can buy or sell and you can take both sides of the transaction that makes people so confused with this. Right. I I think if people think about it as a two-party transaction, it becomes much more simpler and if we described a covered a covered call in the circumstances of you owning something and me paying you for the privilege to potentially own it, it would be much simpler. So essentially, a covered call is, let's say Ross owns 100 shares of ABC Company. And he thinks that and he's going to... I do own it. He does. No. <laughs> All right. I have 100 shares. Go. All right. He thinks he'd be willing to sell at a certain price... He'd be okay letting it go. It's trading at $100 a share. He says, if it gets to 105, I'm okay selling it. I'm okay owning it. If it doesn't, that's fine. I, on the other hand, think that ABC Corporation is a great stock and uh, it's going to skyrocket and I'd be excited to buy it at $105 per share. Especially if it's go- if it's going to go up to 150 Right. And I believe, I believe it is. Yeah. All right. So... Ross says, hey, here's Daniel. He would love to own this. He thinks it's going to skyrocket. I don't have such high expectations of it. Daniel's willing to pay Ross a few bucks, a few shekels, for the privilege of buying this stock at $105, which he thinks will be worth $150 soon. Ross says, I was going to sell at $105 anyway. If you're willing to pay me, go for it. And that's essentially the transaction. Now, if it doesn't get up above 105, Ross keeps the money. I never buy the stock and we can play the game again next month. If it goes to 150, I get the advantage of buying it for the 105. Ross was going to sell it at 105 anyway, and everyone's better off for it. Ross gets to pocket the, the money that I paid him as part of the transaction. Yeah. So based on Scott's question, this works exactly like he's thinking about it because he's already setting limit orders and saying, I'm willing to sell it at X. Right. That's basically what this is. A covered call is like setting a limit order you get paid to set. Now, there's a couple things that are going to matter here. Covered calls work. I'm not going to say they work better. The premium, the amount of income you receive, the profitability of this strategy, you make more money the closer you are to the current price. So, If the stock's at 100 and I'm willing to sell for 105, I'm looking at something 5% away. So the market is going to price in how likely is it that this thing moves 5%. On a really sleepy, boring company that doesn't move 5% very often, the amount of premium you're going to get for that is not going to be very high. On a very volatile company, the amount of premium you're going to get for a 5% move might be very high because it might do that twice a week, right? It might go up and down 5% twice a week. That is so likely that we're going to price in a really, really fat options premium because people are willing to bet on that volatility. So the sleepier the company, the lower your covered call premiums tend to be. That's okay as long as like this strategy still works, but just know that. And so the further out you try and set your limit price, the less income you're going to get. So if the stock is trading at 100 and you want to wait till it gets to 110, a 10% away covered call is unlikely to, to pay you a lot in most stocks that I've looked at. It's just too far up. Now, again, if you think there's going to be a monster move, 
That's why the other person is taking the other side of this bet. They're willing to pay you for that because, yeah, whatever, that's probably not going to happen. But if it does, I'm, I'll take it. So just know when you're looking at covered call premiums, when it starts to get really, really juicy, where you start looking at it and you're like, wow, it's at 100. If I sell a 105 call, somebody's willing to give me three, four bucks for it. So like three, four percent of your position. The market is telling you that it expects that stock to go way up. Like the fatter those call premiums are, the more as a covered call writer, when you look at that and go, ooh, that's a really nice premium today. The reason somebody's willing to give you that is that there's a trader on the other side of that bet that thinks that is very likely. So to me, the options market is both a, like this is a wonderful strategy. I think it's, it's going to work exactly the way you want it to. But I think the second layer of this is reading the tea leaves on what is the options market telling you it expects, because that's what you're seeing priced in every time you look at it. For sure. And if you're an amateur options trader, the other thing to keep in mind is every contract commands 100 shares of stock. So you might not have the ability to control how much you're selling down if, you're, if you need those to be smaller share numbers. So if you get called out of a stock, if, if in the Ross Daniel example, the stock jumps to 150, I'm, I'm going to exercise my option. Every contract is going to be 100 shares of stock, which can be a little bit if a stock is trading for you know, five, 10, $20. But if it's stocks trading for several hundred dollars, that might be a bigger dollar amount sale. If you've never done this before, I would recommend placing your first options trade on like a very low risk version of this. I would look for a stock that you're willing to buy that is at a low share price. So normally when we talk about share prices, we don't care. I don't care if a stock is worth a thousand bucks a share. That doesn't mean it's an expensive stock. It just means the share price is high. But for this, the actual share price does matter because you're working in a hundred share blocks. And so anything you can't buy a hundred shares of becomes basically out of reach to try this. So I would go find a stock that is, I don't know, under 10 bucks that you are willing to own, buy it, and then write a call. So you could, because you have to buy the 100 shares, right? So if you buy something for five bucks a share, you're buying $500 worth of the stock. And then I would write a call against it to watch how it interacts and let that be the first time you do it. Because if you're talking about something where it's, you know, five, 15% of your portfolio, depending on the size of your portfolio, I think we're talking about large numbers. I would not have the first time you try this be representative of that large of a chunk of your wealth, unless it's like your third day investing. Cause I, I just, I think you need to watch how this happens a couple times and get comfortable with the activity. So to the extent that you can find something low priced where you're willing to own a hundred shares and then let it go, I would try this once in a low risk, low stress environment at a minimum before trying it with a meaningful slug of your portfolio. If you feel confident that you've placed the trade correctly, I don't think there's a lot of complication there. The craziest part for someone new doing this is watching that option in your portfolio and seeing the gain loss any given day. It just looks crazy. And you might feel like, what is going on here? Like, How have I lost 70% in this position? And if you don't understand what's happening underneath that, I feel like that's the part that looks the most complicated for a newbie trading options. Um, but love the idea, love the strategy. I, I think it makes sense. Let's do one last one because I think this will be a little bit quick and it's kind of a follow-up note to a prior episode. This is an email that came to us from Doug who said the subject was student loans to invest. So this goes back to our episode where we were talking about what if you could buy long-term like index fund stock with a loan the same way you can buy a mortgage and buy a home with it or take out a mortgage and buy a home with it. He says that he was in a fortunate position for college and med school that he was going to be able to graduate with zero loans. But in his third and fourth year of med school, took a, a loan of about 20000 each year and invested that into an S&P 500 index fund, which that student loan at that time was about a 3% rate. And then he was able to consolidate them even lower 
at 2.625 with a 30-year amortization. So basically a 2.5% loan over 30 years that he got to use to buy stocks. And that's after graduating in 2010. So that has worked out well. That's awesome. I smiled when I read that. I was like, that's great. He's, he's our kind of people, apparently. Yeah. I, when we worked at The Motley Fool, we had heard some stories, and I don't know people or amounts or anything like this, that like during the financial crisis, some of them had taken out home equity lines of credit and bought stocks with it and some things like that. That's a very aggressive maneuver. I think the key is that nobody's willing to write that loan against the stock portfolio. You're only willing to write that loan if you've got other collateral. So a medical right. loan, the collateral is that you're going to have to go to work. Right. That's, exactly. that's You are the collateral, right? In a student loan, that's what's happening. They are betting that you will be able to make money and pay that loan back, which for doctors, pretty safe bet, I would guess. Can we talk about how crazy... I mean, we don't need to talk about it. That's a crazy lending system just in general. Student like they're loan? not uh, they're not underwriting you as a human. They're just like, oh, you want to go to school? Cool, we'll give you money. I mean, they kind of are, but not you specifically. They they probably should be. That's what I'm saying. Is this person competent enough to maintain employment after they graduate? I don't know. Let's give them two hundred thousand dollars and see what happens. I I feel like we've said it on the show before, but that's what I love about the Neil Brennan joke, where he gave up on college and he and he basically said, "I realized it was essentially a small business loan, and I was the small business." And they said, yeah. "Well, what's your plan?" He goes, "Well, I'm going to black out every night for four years, and uh, then I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to take my you know whatever nonsense degree he was pursuing. I don't want to like be mean to anybody's degree, but yeah, like that that's where that joke comes from. Yeah, it's really a factor of." Do I think this person is going to make enough to pay me back? Yeah. Well, there's that college. I think it's in the Midwest that's giving free tuition and you pay a percentage of your income afterwards, I believe. And I think it's recommended percentage. It's like up to you. Just like pay it forward later. It is. I mean, that's that's an equity investment instead of a debt investment in the in the student. It is. That's 100% what that is. is right, yeah. And if you are betting on yourself, if you want to own your company... You obviously want debt instead of equity. Yeah. Right? Like when you start a business, you don't want to give away 75% of your startup because it's not worth anything and you need the money to get rolling. Like that's not what you want to do. And so, yeah, I, I find that fascinating. How different would college be if the college was 100% committed to you in the sense that their earnings are your earnings? They're going to get... What, who I don't know what the percentages are. Five percent of your income every year for the rest of your life, or two percent. What whatever. Then who who cares? Like it do, it almost doesn't matter. It does matter what the percentage is, but it doesn't for the example of would you give that away and how does that change their incentive structure to help you have a good career or to yeah. get you off onto a track that is productive? That like I loved my school. I loved my college experience. That was the one thing I don't think they did very well was nobody of note really recruited at Christopher Newport when I went there. It was like, do you want to work at the Newport News shipyard? Would you like to be a, a state farm agent? No disrespect to anyone that's a state farm agent. Or I think the one company that was big was like Ferguson, uh, which has like naming rights on the art center there. But it was like a very small, it was like a lot of mom and pop companies you know, Google and like Facebook and like they didn't recruit at Christopher Newport. They recruit at Stanford, right? Like, but it, it, yeah, it wasn't like investment banking firms down there recruiting. It was like normal local jobs, which is fine. But that wasn't like exciting at the time. It was like you walk through a career fair and you're like, well, this, this isn't very good. I, I don't know what, I don't want to do any of what these people are doing. Yeah, sign me up for the shipyard for whatever it's worth. I'm I'm there. Yeah, they it, it was not a jump start to an incredible career other than the educational foundation. You're going to have to go get it. But uh, so I, yeah, I don't there's no shade that I'm throwing at Christopher Newport cuz I again, I love the school and I think it's continued to get better and I think there's probably better firms and companies that recruit there now cuz they've done a good job of being increasingly relevant in the world, but yeah, at the time that I graduated, it was like, yeah, this this ain't it. 
Yeah. Anyway. But 2.625, was that the rate student loan that you threw in the S&P in 2010? I, I can't imagine. That's great. I, if you gave me a 30-year loan at 2.625 right now, I would buy stocks with that. If that was available today, I would I would 100% do that. I'm crazy enough to do that. And, yeah. and you were smart enough to do it then after the market had gotten its teeth kicked in. Like, heck of a win. That, I, I bet that worked really, really, really well. That student loan interest deduction might apply too. <laughs> Leveraged <laughs> returns. Let's yeah, leave baby. it on that happy note. Thank you, everybody who writes into our show, who listens to our show. We're going to f- apparently try and figure out what's going on with Apple and why people can't download it. But thanks, everybody. We will catch you on another week. Check your balances at outlook.com is the email address for us. If it doesn't get stuck in our spam folder, we're going to fix that eventually, but we're working on it. We'll catch you all next time. 